Well, we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 20 this morning, as we continue in the life of Jesus and see how he is truly the king of Israel. And uh, though a rejected king, he's on his way to being received. He's been received by many in the world throughout generations. And now the attention is going back to Israel. And uh, it's exciting to see. Um, man, it's exciting. Well, it's been uh, a lot of events. But I guess before I get into that, let me just say that we have a couple of things coming up that you should know about. Um, if you want to be involved with VBS here, our Vacation Bible School, we have over 100 kids that come out every year for over a week with us, or for a week, five days with us, uh, to uh, hear the gospel, to uh, learn about Jesus, and it is uh, just an incredible, incredible time. And if you would like to help with that, uh, you can uh, come to a meeting that's this afternoon, uh, right after second service. Uh, I think it's 1 o'clock. Um, show up at 1230. It's 1 o'clock. There's pizza. So if you just even want, just want pizza, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> come on out uh, and join us for that meeting. And uh, also, we have a men's retreat coming up in May uh, that we want to make sure you know about uh, men. May 17th through the 19th, super excited. We're at a new location this year. It's a Deloro uh, camp. It's a Salvation Army camp uh, that's just outside of Nevada City. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's in the trees. It's got its own lake. It's a beautiful facility. The facility's nicer than Zephyr, and uh, it just is missing Lake Tahoe, but uh, this is uh, nice, too, because it's a, it's a big lake. And it's private, so um, really going to be a neat time. That uh, we're going to be going through uh, the Book of Acts, looking at four different uh, people in uh, history that uh, exemplified Christ's character in uh, wonderful ways. Uh, we have a Bible teacher coming to us from Florida. Uh, he is uh, Rich Hennessy. Is uh, his some of his kids come to our church, and so we are blessed to have him come on out. And share with us, and uh, you could even look him up online. He is a wonderful Bible teacher, so I'm super excited about that time. The cost is $240. We're trying to keep it as low as possible uh, with prices these days. Uh, this, these days, but uh, that that includes uh, you know the whole weekend and all your food, and uh, and uh, it's just the whole thing. So it's going to be a blessed time. Come on out for that. Sign up today. Uh, don't wait uh, so we know how to plan. And uh, I wanted to share with you what's going on with Israel. Uh, many of you know and have been following. If you follow uh, Amir Shafadi, he, he'll keep you updated, and, and there's a lot of others that do. And such unique times. Um, for the first time uh, in, in many years, many years, Israel was attacked by a nation. Uh, Iran attacked Israel, and it wasn't a small attack. Iran uh, may downplay it, but the reality is that we're over 400 missiles that were launched, and some of them at the top technology in the world today, ballistic missiles that only take 12 minutes to get all the way from Iran, over 1,000 miles away, uh, to hit Israel. And uh, multiple, uh, there were, like I said, 400 different types, over 400 different types of, um, well, three different types of missiles uh, over 400 of them coming all at the simultaneously as an organized attack to break down the defense system of Israel and uh, to slip in and uh, cause havoc. They were not uh, smart bombs. They weren't looking for strategic targets. They were just uh, coming in such a mass array that uh, they would hit something and somebody. And the Lord stopped at 100%. And... Uh, I've heard a lot of the glory of man after that. And it's interesting. I think of Gideon and how the Lord uh, said to Gideon, you have too many with you um, because uh, if, if I give you victory, you'll give yourself glory. And that's exactly what has happened is there's been a lot of glory uh, for the uh, United States, for UK, for uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, 
uh, all involved along with Israel and all using uh, smart, uh, you know, intercepting type missiles and uh, like the Iron Dome and uh, David's sling, I think, you know, larger uh, missile systems to handle the bigger stuff. And, um, but, but uh, there was a 100% stop to this. And um, God also helped with uh, a lot of it going off on the tarmac in Iran. They, they, they would blow up before they even took off. Uh, and then a lot of them going into the ocean and not even hitting targets. And like I said last week, there was one hanging in the power lines <laughs> uh, that had been caught by the power lines. It was a drone, but it, it looks like an airplane with a missile airplane, a missile with wings. Uh, and, uh, and so God 100% protected. But here's a letter that Amir Shafadi shared with us um, that uh, a scientist in Israel wrote to his rabbi. He works for their defense system, and he is a doctor of physics. And he wrote the following to his uh, rabbi. He said this, I wanted to share with the rabbi something that is much more than feeling. That on Shabbat, that was Saturday, on Saturday night or Friday, our Friday nights, their Saturday night, well, actually they're ahead of us, so it was, it was our Saturday night. That on Shabbat night, something happened here on a scale of the splitting of the Red Sea. Yes. He said, I am a doctor of physics and I worked for several years in the defense industry in Israel. In projects that are still in cutting edge of the state of Israel, when I look at what happened on Saturday night, on a scientific level, it, is sim it simply cannot happen. Everyone, and I mean everyone, acted as one man in overall unity. He continued, the likelihood that everything worked out just as it should does not exi uh, exist in complex systems like the defense systems that were operating. They have never, and I mean never, been beyond the state of Israel, been tried in, it, uh, in real time. I took a pencil and dove into the calculations to check the likelihood that such a result would uh, materialize. The larger number of events that happened to be handled at precisely the right time doubles the chance of making a mistake. With all the high-tech technology, the expectation was for a breach in the defense of the skies of the state of Israel. Even if we, cannot, even if we got 90% protection, it would be a miracle. What happened, though, is that everyone, I mean everyone, the pilots, the system operators, the technology operators acted as one man at one moment in total unity. If this is not an act of God, then I no longer know what a miracle is. The doctor marvels and adds, this is sharper than the victory of the Six-Day War or the War of Independence. There, there it can be explained according to, uh, to nature. The rescue that took place for the people of Israel at Shabbat night is simply impossible naturally. I believe that this miracle saved the lives of many people from Israel. If the defense system had failed to inter uh, intercept a number of cruise missiles, the result would have dragged us into a very complex campaign. And he means nuclear. And so, um, at least that's my interpretation, so very complex. <laughs> God acted uh, for Israel, and that not just 90%, but 100%. And, and what he's saying, and, and I totally get this, to be in sync with not just your own country, it's a miracle when two human beings can operate in unison, but to have entire military forces operating in unison with things that take split second decision and operation, you gotta, you gotta go after the right missile at the right time. If, if two nations are going after the same missile, then that's just an opening for the missile next to it to go by. And so nothing got through. 
And he's just going, this is impossible. This is mathematically impossible that this happened. It had never been tested with multiple nations. You know, Israel has had their Iron Dome acting with much smaller, slower missiles. But uh, cruise missiles are hard enough to put ballistic missiles in and at a multiple level at the same time. Uh, You guys saw uh, Maverick, uh, you know, Top Gun Maverick when they launched their tomahawks all at the same time to take out the tarmac uh, of the enemy. Uh, that's, this, that's the same idea, and yet they were able to defend all of it and take every single one out. Not one uh, missile landed in Israel. And, so, and then their response uh, was just magnificent. They uh, hit three different strategic targets. Uh, one of them was a nuclear site there in Iran, um, and uh, they were able to strike and get everyone out safely. It was just a perfect operation. Once again, beyond statistics, God is working and he's at hand, his hand is upon all this, and it's exciting as believers to see that, to know that. Uh, when will the world recognize it? It's going to have to get pretty bad. Um, Ezekiel 38 and 39 is still ahead of us, and that's when the world will recognize God's glory. Because that's when the army and the statistics are so beyond possible and there is no help for Israel and Israel stands alone. They can't even give IDF credit. They can't give Iron Dome credit or any other um, means. It's going to be purely God, God and God alone that's going to wipe out those armies and dissolve them in moments. And so uh, they're going to be burning their weapons for seven years. Wow. It's incredible. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, I think you should know that. I don't, you know, I just encourage you not to jump the gun. There's a lot of things that aren't in place. Uh, it is a miracle that, uh, I don't, that's going too far. It's amazing. It's amazing to see that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is developing. That's just amazing that Russia and Iran are in cahoots. The Bible says they're going to be. That Turkey is developing that way and, and uh, they're, uh, uh, part of the talks, and then as well as some other African nations that are going to be involved in the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. But that war, Israel will stand alone and have no help. That war uh, will not be a religious war. The motivation of Islam to destroy Israel will not be there. That's what is still taking place. Iran is just religiously hating Israel and wants to destroy Israel. So this is still a religious conflict. And, it, and, and it's to remove the people of Israel from the land. And that hasn't changed. It will change. And Russia will come down because Israel's wealth. And, and, and the way I look at it, they're not wealthy enough. Because this is not talking about just, oh, techno, technological secrets. They, they can steal those through espionage and spying. They can steal that kind of technology. Uh, what do you come for? You come for masses of amounts of oil, land, uh, land wealth, uh, riches. Israel's just not there yet to be tempting enough for Russia. So th- that's another reason why we still have more time, uh, because God says He's going to put a hook in in uh, Magog, and it's Gog is the leader in Gog's mouth, and draw him down into battle. He's going to force him into battle, and it will not be religiously motivated. It will be simply, we need the money. We need the wealth. And so that's still yet to happen. We have things that are still happening right now with the war at present that I believe are going to continue to escalate, and we're going to see more of the the local war and more uh, uh, takeover of the lands around them. And so we just need to continue in prayer. And uh, last week we had our prayer service, and God answered every prayer, I tell you. It was such, I mean, it's, oh, don't, can't, don't take this for granted at all that God acted on our, our behalf as we prayed for Israel. Uh, you know, that's not pride speaking, that's faith in God. He's called us as the priesthood, and we are to pray for Israel and for God's hand in Israel. Well, it's going to feel like whiplash going back now to Matthew chapter 15 because we're going to be looking at the, 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 the first coming of Christ and his rejection, and that's what we're building up to as we are in chapter 15, as, as Jesus is uh, ministering now, not openly and in the cities, because uh, the government, 
That is, uh, the Israeli powers that be have rejected the ministry of Christ and are seeking to destroy him more and more. And uh, it just keeps heightening with every conflict, every encounter with him. Uh, And so now he is ministering out in the open, but there are still multitudes following him. And that won't change. That won't change. Uh, There will be multitudes following him all the way to Passover when he gives his life, but we're still a year out from that. And so the multitudes are now leaving the cities like John the Baptist. They're coming into the wilderness to hear Jesus. And he's up there in um, Gennesaret, and that's the picture of Gennesaret. That's the, the, the farmlands, the plains that are between the cities. Magdala down at the, the bottom of the screen and at the top of the screen is Capernaum, and in between was all this farmland Uh, where uh, Josephus tells us it was the most fertile area for growing crops, and there were crops, and it was so beautiful, and this is where Jesus has gone, uh, and the multitudes have run out after him, and the, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes have come from Jerusalem to question him. They've questioned him in front of the multitudes. Jesus has responded them with a question, because their question was, why do your disciples not keep the traditions of the elders? And this was, uh, for them, this was greater than breaking God's law. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. Greater than breaking God's law. They were ignoring the traditions of the elders. And they had uh, absolute authority uh, in, in Judaism. And so now Jesus then points out to them uh, here in verse 3 of 15, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition. Look, I've come to restore the worship of God, not the worship of man. And what he's pointing out is that your traditions are man-based and contradict God's word. Now, not all traditions, and we're not begging on all traditions. There's a lot of good traditions in culture and, and in many cultures. But when it comes to God's word and overthrowing or thwarting or hindering God's word and the obedience to it, that's when traditions need to be set aside. And you go with God's word. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. And so he gives an example, and we looked at that a couple of weeks ago, of what uh, they had done to break the Lord's commandments. But then Jesus goes on to say this, that Isaiah was correct when he prophesied about these guys. And it says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so he points it out and says, Look, you have flipped it upside down. You've put an emphasis on the outward appearance. You put an emphasis on what man sees and what man judges, and in so doing, you have inadvertently and maybe even on purpose overthrown the word of God for your own selfish means or gain. And so he points this out to them. This is a perfect opportunity to go for these guys to go, wow, you are right. That is so reasonable and makes total sense. We should repent right now and get rid of that particular custom or tradition. No. No, they just got madder. And so now Jesus turns to those who will listen, who will hear. And that's where we're at in Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. And um, let's pray. Did we pray? I feel like we haven't prayed, so this is a perfect moment to pray. Lord, we just want to pray, Father, that you would speak to us now through your word as we head into new territory, that, Lord, we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that, Lord, we would understand what it is you were saying to them as well as to us today, because your word never changes, and it is applicable for every generation. It is relevant for who we are today and what we deal with in our own society and culture. And so, Lord, strengthen us, empower us, and give us faith, Lord, as we walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 
So the title of the message is The Heart of the Matter. The Heart of the Matter. And Jesus now reveals exactly what he's after. And he also establishes some revolutionary thought in the Jewish culture. Uh, you've got to see how revolutionary this is. This is so ingrained that his disciples will not get this. They will not get this until Acts chapter 10 and 11. And then they will spend from Acts chapter 10 to Acts chapter 15 arguing about it. And they won't actually come to a consensus until the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15 on these words Jesus is saying right here a year before he goes to the cross. That's how revolutionary this moment is. That's how incredible this moment is. That even uh, Peter, you will see, just does not get it. And even though Jesus explains it, still don't get it. No way. Because it is so against what they had been taught and brought up. It was so revolutionary in, in thinking that it was a new covenant. And they were having a hard time letting, a go, letting go of the old covenant to receive the new covenant. Jesus said they would. He said, you know, it's, it's like old wineskins. You can't reuse old wineskins. That leather is dried out. It's cracked. You put new wine and it begins to ferment. It will pop and burst that wine bag and you'll lose all the content. You got to use new wineskins. So he, what he was telling them is you got to let go of what you understood in the old to understand the new. It's not throwing it away. It's it's seeing it through a new set of eyes, heavenly eyes, the way it was intended to be seen the whole time. But they had gotten so sidetracked because the frailty of man is to overemphasize the physical. I mean, you got to take that in. The frailty of man is to overemphasize the physical and diminish the spiritual. And they go hand in glove, yes. And they should be, there should be fruit in the physical, but it begins in the spiritual, it begins in the heart, it begins in the mind, and that's exactly where Jesus is going to drive home. And so, let's jump in and read verses 10 and 11. It says, when he had called the multitude to himself. Now, the scribes and Pharisees are still standing there. And uh, instead of answering their question to them, he answers the question to the multitude. And why is that? Because their question was not an honest question. It was, it was political debate and rhetoric. They were looking like a, a cat to pounce. They were, it was just, they were just baiting the line and throwing it out there at Jesus. They weren't looking for an honest answer. They weren't looking for instruction. And yet the people are caught up in the hype. They're looking at their leadership who they hold high, high up, but they're also looking at Jesus, who is now even greater in their eyes. And so now they're looking at both, and they're like, well, okay, yeah, this is a big issue. Why aren't your disciples keeping the traditions of the elders? You see that, that hand washing that we talked about a couple weeks ago was built upon uh, the principles of Leviticus. And we'll talk more about that. Um, in a moment. I'm kind of jumping ahead. So this is what he says. When he called the multitude to himself, he said to them, he says to the multitude, hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Very, very revolutionary. Like, wait a minute. Isn't Judaism built on uh, what you eat? Like you don't eat certain foods that are unclean and you eat foods that are clean and you really watch out for that stuff. That really is a huge part of the Jewish faith and an action of their faith. And he just said, uh, what goes into your mouth really doesn't matter. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you, what are you saying? Well, let's give him a chance. Let's see what he has to say here. Jesus is now going to zero in on the heart, and that's what we're seeing here. Look at what happens here in 1 Samuel and what God says to even Samuel the prophet. As Samuel was choosing the next king after Saul was rejected as being king, 
he came to Jesse's house in Bethlehem and he asked Jesse to see his sons. Jesse brings seven of his sons out before Samuel. And when Samuel sees the oldest son, here's his response. So it was when they came, the sons, that he looked at Eliab, and that's the oldest, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. Because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And you see, this is Jesus. He has come. He sees the whole religious system. He sees the good and the bad. He sees the, the, the righteous and the corrupt and how it's all melded together, and that there's so much confusion in what's right and what's wrong and who's right and who's wrong, and there's so much confusion on the right practice because people cannot see the heart, and that includes us. And we can see corruption in our own faith and in our own keeping of our faith today. So it's very pertinent and very practical for us today to recognize that we can't see the heart we can hurt someone who's truly seeking, and we can, we can welcome somebody who isn't seeking at all because we can't see motives and heart. We can only see what's on the outside surface there. And yes, we're to judge a tree by its fruit, but we're not the perfect fruit detectors, are we? Sometimes we get it wrong and we misdiagnose. And so there is a warning there for us that uh, we have to be careful that we let God be the judge. We let God be the judge. And so in verse 12, his disciples come to him. Mark tells us it's when they're in the house. Okay, so now Jesus, he makes this statement in front of the multitude. And it's a radical statement. I guarantee the, the multitude wasn't ready for it. You know, it's like even his own disciples weren't ready for it. And that's why when they get into the house and they're alone with Jesus, they point out something very concerning. And they say, uh, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Like, uh, Lord, that, that didn't work. You didn't talk them down. You talked them up. You uh, ticked them off. And uh, that's scary. And that's uh, obviously this is what it's building up to because Remember when Lazarus dies in John chapter 11 and uh, they're, they're up there in the north and they're like, uh, Thomas is like, are you sure you really want to go down? There? They're trying to kill you down there. Is that a good idea that you go down there to help him? And, uh, you know, Jesus is like, no, let's go. It's time to go. It's after four days. They, they get down there and he's like, all right, let's go die. Because they knew that uh, Jesus had made the, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of Israel, mad enough, uh, and more than that, they felt like they had religious grounds to stand on, like a statement like this, that they needed to go after him, that he was uh, a, apostate and that, that he was uh, blaspheming God, and they were determined to, to take him out. And they thought they did God's service. That's exactly why Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And so heavy stuff as we look at this and we see things getting more and more in, intense. The, his disciples came and said, did you know that you have offended these guys? Now, why? Why were they so offended? Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, like the custom of last uh, couple weeks ago, there were many customs that they kept, but they were all stemmed from the Old Testament, Leviticus. There were many uh, laws in, in Leviticus about what you ate and what you didn't eat. Uh, there were cleansing laws for the priests, the priesthood, when they would uh, go and serve in the temple. And what rabbis had done is they had taken those principles and they had applied them to the people. And it's not a, a far leap. It's to say, you know, hey, you are a priest in your own house. This is what they were saying. Your house is your temple. Your dinner table is the altar. Your food is the sacrifice and you are the koan or the priest. Therefore, 
when you go to eat, you need to be purified and cleansed from all the contaminants that are in the world. When you go to the market, when you come in contact with Gentiles, uh, there, is, uh, there is corrupting dirt on you, and you need to ceremonially cleanse. And so we went through that process. That it was not just a quick washing of the hands, but there was an actual um, religious uh, act that you did in, in a certain way, a certain form, lifting your hands up, putting them down, pouring the water a certain amount, at least making sure that you cleansed, rubbing it together right. It's still, uh, the, the principles are still at work today in Israel, uh, and it's based on Leviticus. And so there are traditions that are, they're not harmful. Jesus doesn't make a comment on that tradition or beg on it, but he makes a comment on the principle and he says, it's not so much the outside of a man that's going to defile him, it's the inside. That's the source of sin and the root of sin. And so here's the, the doctrine of the Pharisees were based upon their tradition, their legalism. That is self-righteousness. That's legalism. Self-righteousness and getting to heaven on your own through your own merits. Hypocrisy, pretending like you're actually doing it. That's hypocrisy. Yeah, I'm nailing it. No mistakes. And then external focus, external focus. It's not about the heart. It's about the hands. Hey, if I've never murdered, then I'm good. And Jesus came on the Sermon on the Mountain. What did he say? Oh, on the contrary. On the contrary. That if you've hated, you've committed murder. And if you've lusted, you've committed adultery. And it's like, oh, that's coming from the heart. You see, that was not their focus. That was, not, that, that was unmanageable. Let's be real. That's unmanageable for humanity. To change the heart? I can't change my heart. I can't change my attractions, my temptations. All I can do is resist them. That's the best that I can do. And that's why religion is anemic when it comes to saving. It can't save. Because if you commit it in the heart, it's still committing it. And that's Jesus' point on the Sermon on the Mount. And that's why the disciples ended with, well, then who can be saved? If you've got to do better than the scribes and Pharisees, who can be saved? With man, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And so these guys, uh, let's, let's turn over to 1 Timothy. Uh, this is going to help us to see some New Testament application here with what they were dealing with, because their problems are our problems. Nothing's changed. We're still human. It's not like, oh, great, Jesus came and fixed it all, only for those who receive in faith. But there's a lot of corruption in the church. There's a lot of people trying to do it the wrong way. And so it says this in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, now, in the, the, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will... Depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, hip hypocrisy and lies go well together, don't they? That's when you say something works that you know doesn't work. Like, I tried it and it worked for me, but not really. I'm pretending that it worked for me. That's religion in so many areas and in so many ways. Oh, just do this. Just do this and you're fine. No, no, you need Jesus. You need to surrender to him and let him, through his power, lift you up. It's, it's not a how-to, it's a who. It's a who to go to. Having their own conscience seared. They're going to have their own conscience seared. They won't even feel bad about what they're doing. It's the same idea as the blind leading the blind that we'll get to in a moment. Verse 3, forbidding to marry. They're going to forbid to marry. These doctrines of demons that are so deceptive. It's uh, saying marriage is no answer for sexual purity. Uh, you, you just forget it. Marriage is just nothing but problems. And there's so many that are in the church today that will discourage their young children, and I mean in their 20s, from getting married. There's so many. Oh, you're not ready. You're not ready. You know what I've found? You're never ready. <laughs> you will get married and you'll go, what have I done? 
sweet Jesus, what have I done? Because it's bigger than you, isn't it? Two selfish people coming together, what happens? Friction. And in that friction, God begins to work and move. If you're surrendered to him, what marriage will do is it will refine you beautifully. And you will sparkle like you've never sparkled before. It is not good for a man to be alone. And so, uh, man, some people just hold out and hold out and hold out. Not good. Not good. You're just going to create habits and problems that are harder to break. The older you get, the harder it is to meld with another human being. You get really set in your ways. And you have to marry a very compliant person who's willing to work with you and all your rules. Because you're not about to change your rules. Hey, I have managed my life now for 30, 35 years, and I'm good to go. Don't mess with, the, with my life. Well, guess what? You just signed up for somebody to mess with your life when you got married. <laughs> And so you can see why so many shy away from it or hold the covenant at such a low level. Well, just get out. Unreconcilable differences. Every marriage has unreconcilable differences. My marriage to Christ has unreconcilable differences. The only reason I'm still married to him is that he forgave me. The only reason that I am still married to him is that he sacrificed everything for me. And that is exactly how you enter into marriage. Ready to forgive and sacrifice everything for that person. If you're not ready, your marriage will not last. Someone must sacrifice. It only takes one. And so you need to go in prayerfully and you need to go eyes wide open and obedient to the Lord. But it's something that the Lord has for many that they're not being obedient in. And so this is a doctrine of demons in the last days that will prevent many from being married and cause very harmful sins to be produced in their lives. And so it's a good warning. And here's the next one. Commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And this one's tied to what we're about to talk to, talk to you about is making a religion out of food. And many have done it. I hold to the religion of food. I am a vegan. I am a vegetarian. I'm a carnivore. I'm <laughs> There's all these diets out there today, and people swear by them, and they preach them. And they're, it's the focus. It's the focus of their life. And, and my workout regimen, boom, boom, boom. All of it becomes a religion. And it's got to be careful. This is where these guys had come. They actually taught, remember, the importance of hand washing. If you live in Israel and you hand wash, you're saved. That's what one rabbi said. That was his gospel message. Live in Israel and hand wash. We, I mean, we can, we're, we're far. We're, kind of, we're far removed, so it's easy for us to laugh at that. But, you know, there was like hey, there was the dysphoria that you got to move back home. That's how they felt. Move back home. And you're not moving back home. You're lost. Get back to the homeland and, and keep the traditions. Then you're saved. But even that is still the same thing in our own practices. Oh, I'm saved, but I have so much to grow in. My menu eating. I'll tell you. Hmm, we'll get, I'm get, I don't want to get... Stuck on this verse and not get back to our text. Let's keep reading. Verse 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Very revolutionary thought from Paul there for uh, the Jewish Christians as well as uh, um, New Testament Christians coming out of the world, things sacrificed to idols. Oh, what a huge subject. If it's been sacrificed to an idol, is it spiritually contaminated or is it okay to eat? And that was a huge discussion in those days. Verse 6, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the word of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed, and that is the doctrine of grace. It is grace. It is not these works, these outward signs that make you saved. It is God's grace through his son. 
but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Notice here, the subject of food is tied with exercise. He says, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Uh, you, you see this verse, and, and you can fit right eating in, in with what bodily exercise. Bodily exercise and right eating is profits a little. Yeah, you'll maybe be a little stronger, live a little longer in this life, but guess what? Just a little. Just a little. It's nothing to focus on uh, in your life as a preaching point. Boy, if you have an opportunity to talk to somebody about something important in your life and what's coming out of your, your mouth is diet and exercise, and I'm preaching at me, God help us that we would share the gospel and that we would present Christ as our hope and our answer. Because like Paul's saying right here, there's a little bit of profit, but true godliness in Christ Jesus, boy, that is profitable not only in this life, the changed heart in this life, but in the one to come. And so how beautiful that is. And he goes and closes it out with, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. A faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. And so we can still deal with this kind of stuff today because there are specific doctrines of demons that hinder and focus on the outward. Don't lock yourself down in a marriage. It'll just ruin your life. Or don't uh, you know, eat this or don't drink that. Don't do this. Don't do that. And it's all around what's going into the mouth, not what's coming out of the mouth. That's actually the greater deal. Levitical laws are a picture of the work of Christ in sanctifying us from the inside out. You see, God's intention with those, those uh, pictures of the Old Testament was to show forth uh, what was going on inside. Look, if I need to wash my hands because there's dirt on them, how much more do I need to rend my heart and get my heart right with God? If if I could offend him in what I eat, how much more could I offend him in what I say? You see, they weren't making these connections. Jesus came to bring these connections. You'll notice that, that uh, you know, the, the, the ceremonial aspects of the law weren't calling someone a sinner. For instance, a marital couple, after being united together, was unclean for a time. But it wasn't because of sin. Nor is a woman who is on her menstrual period a sinner because she's on her period. No, it was ceremonially unclean. And you had to go through a cleansing process before you could come into the assembly of God. Uh, in the, in, and so it was pointing to a deeper picture. And I want to show you this in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5 talking about these laws and rituals of the Old Testament, they serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things. So there's a cleansing from the inside that Jesus is talking about that goes even deeper into what is taking place in heaven in the cleansing and the righteousness of God. And it says, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, he had to make it precisely in a certain way because it was a picture of heavenly things. And so um, that's what it goes on to say here. I should have just read it. He said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And then in verse 9 of chapter 9 in Hebrews, it was symbolic for the present time in which both Gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Look, I can sin, do something wrong. I can feel guilty about it. I could take this lamb. I could sacrifice it. I could offer it to God through the priesthood. But he's making the point that you still have your guilty conscience. But oh, when God declares you clean, like David in, in the Psalms when he says, you know, blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, 
whose iniquity is covered. That was because God declared it through the prophet, David, you're clean. God is cleansing you. And, and how much more, how much more, if that was just a picture, how much more we who have the blood of Christ and his sacrifice can receive forgiveness and true release from our past and to walk into the future without the baggage of the past. That's a divine work. Have you received that work? You need to ask God for it if you haven't. God can set you free. It's incredible. And so Romans chapter 7, verse 12, therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. See, he's saying, look, man, those Old Testament laws were righteous. They are good. Just because they couldn't perform or be kept by us doesn't mean they're not good. No, they're perfect pictures of Christ. It's a beautiful picture. It's exactly what God intended it. The law is exactly what it was supposed to be when used rightly. But Hebrews 10.1 confirms for the law having a shadow of, things to, um, of good things to come and not the very image of the things. Why? Because Christ is the very image. He is the fulfillment of these things. That's why I love reading the law. I love looking at it. Why? Because I learn about Christ even better. Like I understand the, the mechanics of my salvation through the law. Like, wow, that's how it took place. Because there's so much more explanation and depiction of what's taking place. And it makes Jesus' cross so much richer. It makes communion with so much more depth and fullness. So I never want to be divorced from the, the Old Testament and from the law and from the understanding of it. Because it's the foundation on which the New Testament sits. And it's a beautiful foundation. And it's been fulfilled in Christ. I no longer trust in the law for my salvation. It couldn't save me. Only Christ could save me. But he fulfilled the law. So to throw the law away is to throw Christ's work away. It, 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 his work doesn't make sense without the law. And so we need it. And that's what's being explained to us here. And so fi finishing up verse 10, can, it can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year Make those who approach perfect. You see, they were just pictures. Pictures don't make perfect. Only the real thing. Jesus Christ makes it perfect. Okay, let's jump back into our text. I need to see what time it is just so I can panic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I'm not seeing the time. I'm like, I don't know where we're at. Okay, verse 13. Okay, I'm panicking. Here we go. He answered and said, every plant, every plant which my father, my heavenly father has planted will be uprooted. Okay, remember they began by saying, uh, Lord, you offended the Pharisees. You should worry about that. Jesus' response was, why? If my father didn't plant them, they're not going to last. They're not going to last. Take that in. Take that in. The government of America... If it was not planted by God, it will not last. The, the governments of this world, if it's not planted by God, it will not last. Look at how we sit here learning today from the apostles whose ministries were planted by God and we are still being edified, built up. And when we get to heaven, their names are written on the foundation of Jerusalem. You see, John 15, 16, Jesus says to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And notice he goes on to say this, and that your fruit should remain. You see, this is the, the exact opposite of what he's saying about these scribes and Pharisees. They're self-appointed, they're not planted by God, and God's going to uproot them. So quit worrying about them. They have no power over you. Yeah, well, sure fooled me when they nailed you to the cross. Oh, you think that was them? Jesus said, no one takes my life. I lay it down of my own free will. He says to Pontius Pilate, you would have no power unless it had been given to you from above. So you have to see that any power and any force in your life that is overwhelming is there by God, and you need to trust God in it. God, how do you want me to respond to this? God, how, how do you want me to honor you? Government is from the Lord. 
We're to honor those in government. We're to pray for those in government that we might live quiet and peaceable lives. You see, this is all important stuff for us to understand and to see. And if they are dishonoring God, hmm, you can feel more sorry for them in the long run. They got to stand before God. 1 Corinthians 3 talks about our own personal lives as Christians. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, he's reflecting on your life and what you build your life out of. What are your building materials of your life? Are they temporal and selfish or are they selfless and eternal? Are you building the kingdom of God with your life or are you building your own kingdom? Your own kingdom's going to burn up. God's kingdom is going to last forever. Each one's work will be, become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will t- uh, test each one's work of what sort it is. And so praise God. Let's go on to verse 14. Let them alone. Let them alone. That's what Jesus says. Don't fuss about them. God's got them. That was verse 13. Now you, what should you do? Let them alone. Don't get all hung up and caught up in trying to take down the false teacher. Shut him up forever. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I even think of, uh, I'll say something controversial here, but this is what just popped into my head. Bonhoeffer was a part of a conspiracy to kill Hitler because he knew that Hitler was bad. But if he had read this verse, he might have saved his life. The verse says, let him alone. Now that may sound weird, but hold on. If God raises up a leader, he can take him out. When when Herod was about to kill Peter after killing James, it looked bad, looked real bad. But God let Peter out and then killed Herod. He took care of it. And when we see in Scripture how God wants us to respond. We are not to be rebels constantly looking for the next revolution. We're to be submissive and trusting God and prayerful for our leaders and actively influencing, but in God's way, through his gospel. Do not forsake the gospel in the secular world, but preach the gospel wherever you go. Verse 14, they are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. What is he saying there? They will soon be revealed for what they are. Don't don't worry about it. Oh, but they're getting away with it. No, they're not. No, they're not. It's been appointed for a man's life, the extent of it and his influence. God has ordained it. And then he shuts it down. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Don't you be a vigilante. You're out there just ready to guard your stuff and guard everything, and let's go get the bad guys. Let's storm the castle. That's worldly thinking. Jesus is teaching us right here. This is very short. You've got a very short lifespan. He's not worried about the fact that you're going to die. You're all going to die. You got it? And you can eat as healthy as you want, and you can live as defensive as you want, and you can learn all the right moves (laughs) and take all the bad guys down, and you're still going to die. And he says, look, I I brought the answer. It's eternal life. I'm giving it to you. It's yours. Now glow in it. Gloat in it. Rejoice in it. Enjoy it. Live for me. Point to me. If you're so busy trying to take down the temporal leaders, do you really believe in eternity? Looks like you don't. Looks like you're more worried about America than you are about God's kingdom. And I think this is really important for us in this year because this is a hard religion that's being pushed down the church's throat in a big way from the pulpits. And there is balance. And that's all I'm trying to say is make sure you're balanced. I'm not saying don't vote. Vote! My goodness, I vote every time. I've missed one accidentally. I was out of country. I have to confess that so that you 
you know, you can't say yeah, I voted every time. But hey, the last one I did, and everybody lost that I voted for. So <laughs> <laughs> was I discouraged a little bit, but I bounced back pretty fast when the Lord reminded me that he's on the throne. Amen. And that's the truth. So let them alone. If the blind lead the blind, it'll be revealed that they're blind. They're both going into the ditch. And so just wait on the Lord in that. All right, verse 15. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. Now, oh, good job, Peter. He, uh, he's like, okay, wait a minute, Lord. You said something really radical out there, and I'm not following that. Because I, I've been taught my whole life to be a good Jew, you better pay attention what goes into your mouth. Because that's a good Jew. You pay attention to what goes into your mouth. And you just said it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's all that what comes out of your mouth. Can you please explain this to me? So Jesus in verse 16 responds, are you also still without understanding? He goes on, oh, not time for that. We got to keep moving. Pushed it out today. Verse 17, shocking, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? Hey, God designed your body to take care of even bacteria. Sometimes you vomit it. Sometimes you shoot it out. <laughs> we'll go no further than that. That was far enough. My wife would say, yep, too far. Okay. <laughs> Verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. It doesn't make you a sinner because you ate with unwashed hands. What makes you a sinner is all those evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and all of those lies and deceit and decept, you know, deceptive ways, all these things thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's, that's slandering God. That's what a blasphemy is, to slander God. And these were what flow out of our hearts through our mouths. So Jesus is saying, your mouth shows off what you're really all about. In fact, Mark goes on to say, your actions as well. It includes it all. But here, we're on a specific subject of the human heart. The human heart. Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. That is, you can be a sinner and a vegetable in a wheelchair. Unable to speak, unable to move, just blink your eyes. You can sin in your mind. That's what Jesus is revealing here. Look, what's in your mind matters. That's who you really are. Yeah, but I didn't do it. Oh, but you wanted to. You wanted to so bad. Your heart was wrong. You confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The difference between religion and true relationship is honesty before God about what's in here. It's not pretending to your neighbors that there's nothing here, there's nothing to see here. We're all good. We're all good. No, what's truly in here? Is, is lived out before God. Jesus really explains this well when he condemns the Pharisees uh, in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. They've cherry-picked. They've cherry-picked the easy stuff of the law. Oh, well, it's easy. I could, I could tithe give 10% of my mint, <laughs> my spices. I mean, that's how on it they were. They, they were really good at tithing. It was what was going on in the heart, the weightier things, justice, mercy, faith. They were ignoring. These you ought to have done. You should have given 10% without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Whoa. <laughs> so a camel is an unclean animal in the Jewish world, okay? So is a gnat. 
And so he's saying, look, you took your cheesecloth, you laid it over the top of your cup, and you poured your glass of wine, and you made sure there were no gnats in your cup before you drank. Then you turned around and ate this big old camel off your plate. Uh, it reminds me of the Diet Coke diet back in the 80s. You know, anybody trying to lose weight was drinking Diet Coke with the two Big Macs and large fry. That was my diet, and it didn't work. <laughs> so, conclusion. Jesus came to transform the heart. He was going way beyond religion way beyond what you do on the outside. He was directing his relationship with you at the heart. Peter, do you love me? Oh, he has more to go with Peter, and he will get there. Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Father, you have prophesied it. You sent your son to accomplish it. And now you're working in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure right from the heart. Lord, we are uh, proud in our own natural state, but you have humbled us and you've brought us to a place of submission to you. And I pray you would continue that work in all of us for we won't be done until we stand before you. But we're so grateful you're doing it. And we're so grateful that you are king. And we just pray that you would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.